Welcome to Shield Maidens, Women of the Norse World, the podcast that celebrates the remarkable women of the Viking Age. From fierce warriors and powerful queens to wise seers and cunning goddesses, these women left an indelible mark on history. Join authors Johanna Wittenberg and K.S. Barton each month as we explore the stories, achievements, and impact of Norse women. Welcome to Shield Maidens, Women of the Norse World. This is episode nine, in which Johanna and I discuss the Viking celebration of Yule. But before we get started, I'd like to mention our Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, you can join us at Women of the Norse World, and we'd love to see you there. Yeah, and um, I've been putting up a little bit of artwork. I will put up some more uh, to go with our podcasts. Great. And I'll, I'll, I've, every now and then I see some picture and I go, oh, that should go on the Facebook page. So, And also, if you enjoy listening to this podcast, please consider giving us a review on whatever platform you listen to us on. So reviews can really help help us out, get the word out about the podcast. And Johanna and I would very much appreciate them. Yeah, it's great for listeners, too, because then they get a good idea of what our podcast is about and whether they might like it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. And it doesn't have to be long. It could just be a sentence or two. That's all it takes. We'd love it if you could do that. Well, I am K.S. Barton. I'm the author of the Norse Family Trilogy, a story in which a young daughter of a Jarl and a Viking warrior are caught in a deadly blood feud between two families. And with me is Johanna Wittenberg. Hi, Johanna. Hello. How are you doing, Kim? Great. Good. I'm Johanna Wittenberg. I'm the author of the Norse Women series, which is the story of a real Norse queen who lived and ruled alone in the early ninth century. And that was the dawn of the Viking Age, probably the most tumultuous time in Norway's history. All right. Well, it's December and the time for winter celebrations. And it should come as no surprise <laughs> that people in the Viking Age celebrated a holiday during midwinter. I mean, what else was there to do? That's that? right. <laughs> and in Old Norse, it's referred to as Yule, um, but it has become Yule. Uh, and that is both J-U-L, the Swedish version, and also Y-U-L-E, which is Old English, which was at one time the same language virtually as Old Norse. Don't they call those sister languages when they're really yes. related like that? Yes. Um, and so at that time in the early Viking age, they could pretty much understand each other. They could yeah. they could speak to each other. But anyway, Yule, Yule or Yule is a plural word and it means parties or feasts. And one of Yod Odin's name is Yolnir. And that means something to the effect of head partier <laughs> <laughs> during this time of year odin led the wild hunt which is a group of supernatural riders who terrorized people and kim will tell us a little more about that yeah so the wild hunt is it's an ancient ancient it's part of ancient germanic folklore and so appeared on the continent and in the uk a lot of different traditions have this this wild hunt, and it my I think in England, I think King Arthur is maybe the leader of the wild hunt, and like different people, different leaders or gods lead these wild hunts. And the Fae in Ireland. Oh, okay, yeah, you know a lot more about Ireland than I do. So, but yeah, I think it's and and I and I just this morning was wondering like why would something like that be a thing, or unless it's just started in one place and then spread out, but. Yeah, why would something like a, a a terrifying wild hunt <laughs> be so common? But anyway, the, the wild hunt is heard only during the dark parts of the winter near Christmas or Yule. And it was like Johanna said, it was terrifying. So if you were out at night when it went by, the wild hunt would sound like a group of spirits flying overhead. And it would often be accompanied by barking dogs and the occasional shout of the huntsman. And in some legends, if you're unlucky enough to encounter the wild hunt, you should never address the huntsman and you 
do anything to draw attention to yourself. Just stay quiet and like throw yourself on the ground (laughs) and hope that they pass over you and you get through it unscathed. (laughs) We regularly talk about how Tolkien was inspired by Norse mythology and legends. So it should come as no surprise that the wild hunt shows up in his work. So there's a reference to the wild hunt in The Hobbit. So when Bilbo and the dwarves are in that dark forest of Mirkwood, they cross an enchanted stream when the dwarf bomber is knocked into the water by a fleeing deer. So all kinds of you know commotion happens. And then the dwarves and Bilbo, they fish bomber out of the river. And that's when they hear it. And this is from the book. They became aware of the dim blowing of horns in the wood and the sound as of dogs baying far off. Then they all fell silent, and as they sat, it seemed they could hear the noise of a great hunt going by to the north of the path, though they saw no sight of it. Wow. Yeah. So it sounds exactly like the wild hunt. Mm -hmm. And that's just in The Hobbit. So there could be a reference to it in the Lord of the Rings with the Nazgul, especially when they were flying, you know, they could, they have been inspired by the wild hunt. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. So, you know, and once, so when the, after they're, you know, they lose their horses, then they get those, as Tolkien calls them, the fell beasts where they're flying in the Mm. sky. And anytime they fly overhead, it just strikes fear into anyone who hears them. I don't even think the orcs like it. And even that's when they're only just shadows in the sky, they're still afraid of it. And in the return of the king, when Aragorn leads his army to the Black Gates of Mordor, the Nazgul follow them in the sky. They just follow oh. them along. And well, even... that really does sound like the wild hunt, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And so here's like a little bit from uh, one of the chapters. On the, I guess well, It was the chapter where... I think it's like at the gate, black gates of Mordor, or something like that. And though the ring wraiths did not yet stoop low upon their foes and were silent, uttering no cry, the dread of them could not be shaken off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's so interesting how they like, they have so many scary things in the Norse world. Like this well, wild it was hunt. scary. It was a scary <laughs> time, a scary place. And, you know, especially in the winter where it's dark so much of the time and then the storms that come through. I mean, I, I am sure that's where the idea for the wild hunt came from was the storms and, you know, maybe also the Northern lights. I don't know. Mm. You know, I was having a discussion with a group of writers not too long ago and, and somebody asked me about the Northern lights and they're like, what did the Vikings think about the Northern lights? And I'm like, honestly, they are almost never mentioned in the sagas. They're not. Or the They're stories. And it was like, are they not mentioned because they were so commonplace and people just didn't even care? Or are they not mentioned because it was too, I don't know. You would think that there would be some kind of, oh, the world is coming to an end. But if it was common, they wouldn't. Well, and it wouldn't that. be common because so much of it is above the Arctic Circle or high enough up, high up, high up, up enough north that, you know, they would have seen them a lot. However, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that they didn't have a meaning for them. It just means that we don't haven't heard about it. We don't know about it. It right. wasn't written down. Yeah. But I remember the the person who asked me was really surprised that they weren't mentioned. It is surprising. It is surprising. It, it surprised me too, when I went to look for it, especially in the Icelandic sagas, that there would be no mention of them. So. Well, I don't think that they said it was a solar flare hitting molecules, <laughs> oxygen <laughs> sure molecules, which is what it is. But I don't think that was their explanation. I, oh, there's no, in, there's no magic in There's no magic in that. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's got to be the gods doing something. <laughs> well, it could be. <laughs> Who knows what causes the solar wind? <laughs> there you go. It's some god's breath or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who was the god of the, there was like a god that, or a Jotun who was associated with fire, wasn't there? Well, he had mm-hmm. a name. Surt? Surt? Maybe. Anyway. Yes. It could be. Him. Okay. Back to Yule. Yes. The Yule <laughs> season began with the Yule block, And that is a sacrifice at the first full moon after the winter solstice. At least that's what is believed. And then the second Yule month is called Yulmanadr. 
which means the old month. And it began with the first new moon after that full moon. Sounds complicated, but things got changed, as Kim will tell us. Yeah, so the the main source that we have for what happened during Yule comes from the story of King Hakan the Good of Norway. And the story is in the Heimskringla, which is a collection of stories about the lives of the kings of Norway. And from this saga, we find that in pre-Christian Norway, people made offerings to the gods, mainly Odin and Freyr, and they ate horse meat during Yule. King Hakan, he was raised as a Christian, and he wanted everyone in the country to convert, but many of them, including some very powerful Jarls, they wanted nothing to do with this new religion. They wanted to keep their old gods. They, I'm sure they were afraid that the old gods would turn on them and would you know, make bad harvests and do all kinds of things. So they were not willing to give up their beliefs of their ancestors. So one thing King Hakan did was he moved the timing of Yule to coincide with Christmas. And interestingly enough, it originally could last up until early February because yeah. of all this new moon and full moon business. So, and they used the lunar calendar instead of the solar calendar. Yeah. So they had to, he had to find a way to take that January holiday. And so they moved it and he just said, people just need to celebrate whatever during this Christmas time. Early Pre-Christian Scandinavians seem pretty flexible for things like that. <laughs> they were probably well, like, and, oh. and the dates moved around a lot. Well, that too. So, so yeah. it wasn't like there was a particular date that these sacrifices and celebrations happened. It was whenever it was after the solstice right. and the full moon. So, you know, he's having it after the solstice. So it probably was acceptable. Well, that's kind of like, we still do that. You know, a lot of religions, we still do that. Mm-hmm. For Christians, you know, Easter falls on a different Sunday every year, exactly. depending. And and at one or, time, Christmas yeah, was that way, yeah, but it was Yule. <laughs> yeah. And Ramadan, you know, that mm-hmm. falls on different different days, too. It's not unusual. Well, and it was the things like the solstice and the full moons and the new moons. That's how they kept track of time. Mm-hmm. They didn't have, you know, calendars like we have them. In, in, they had the prim stuff, but that was a seasonal calendar. It wasn't stuck it wasn't attached to a date it was attached to the moon the phases right. of the moon yeah i bet the equinox was probably also another marker mm-hmm. when the days were equal yep yeah. it, it had to do with harvest and planting yeah and all those things so they were so much more in touch with the seasons and the moon cycles and everything well of course they had to be well they had to be right well there was one yule when king hakan visited one of the Jarls places in Trondheim, which is up in more northern Norway, the king would not pay, take part in that pagan sacrifice or offering, which, you know, the Yule festival included an animal sacrifice. And then they, you know, they would like dip the fill bowls with blood and then dip um, like twigs and things in the blood and sprinkle things with them. And King Hakan wanted nothing to do with any of that or with the toast to the gods. So he and he then refused to eat the horse meat. Now well, that's a big deal. Yeah. And before he drank the broth that had like the horse meat in it uh, or the horse broth, he made a sign of the cross over the bowl. And well, that, wasn't it said that didn't didn't someone say, oh, that was actually Thor's hammer? Yes. <laughs> he tried yes. to explain it away. He tried yeah. to cover it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and they would the people were not happy with King Hakan and his refusal to make the offerings to toast to the gods or even eat the meat. But the following year, he returned to the North and once again, his refusal to participate in the sacrifice and the offerings in eating the horse meat. They So this time things got a little more unruly and I think the King felt a little unsafe. Mm-hmm. So the pressure finally got to him. Because he gave in and he ate some bits of horse liver and then he drank the the mini. Is that how you say it? Mini? Yeah, mini. Mini. It's M-I-N-N-I. So. Yep, and it means remembrance or memory. Yes. Yeah. So it's the mo- like a memorial toast, like you might do to, you know, toast a, a fallen warrior or an ancestor or something. So he did take a little drink of that. And he didn't 
do the sign of the cross over it because they made mention that he did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's finally learning how to play politics. <laughs> That's right. And I think this is a good example of how pre-Christian Scandinavians believe that there was a strong association between the king and the welfare of the land and its people. Very much so. So by refusing to participate in the sacrifice and the offerings and the toasts to the gods, King Hakan was risking the safety and prosperity of everyone, at least, you know, in the, their minds. And and the Scandinavians were very independent of their king. They, they mm -hmm. you know, a king was an elected official as opposed to a hereditary position, had to be a member of the nobility, but he did have to be elected at the thing. And um, they could unelect him. It or was kill him. Or kill him. They <laughs> Things were overthrown pretty regularly in Scandinavia. So, um, you know, I think he took heed for that reason. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, shoot, I shouldn't bring it up because I can't remember exactly what it said. But there was something about like we were all equal, but he was just a little more equal than the rest. <laughs> <or something like. laughs> I don't know where that came from either, but I've, I've heard of it too. But and of course, when they went to Iceland, they didn't have kings. They, right. they you know, they, they had um, officials, chieftains, but no yeah. kings. And they were more religious and judicial than they were. They didn't rule, really. Right. That's true. Well, you know, horse meat was not the <laughs> only thing on the menu during Yule. Not by a long shot. So, you know, when we think of Vikings, you know, we think of these rowdy beer bashes, men in horned helmets, guzzling drink provided by subservient women. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like that. There's no doubt that brewing mead and beer and drinking it was a really important part of ancient Scandinavian life, but it had far more significance and it was far much more orderly and regulated than what we perceive it as. In fact, hosting beer celebrations was once required by law in Scandinavia. Oh. So the like old Oktoberfest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you must have Oktoberfest. <laughs> The oldest written law we have from Norway is the Gulating Law, and it was recorded in the mid 12th century, it was, which was after Norway had become Christian. And um, this law stated that a neighborhood ale feast must be held by at least three householders in common. And if a free man with the means to do so failed to hold the ale feast at the appointed time, he could be fined. Huh. If he was found guilty of allowing a year to pass without sharing in a neighborhood ale feast, his fine was three marks. And if he failed to participate in the ale feast for three winters, he forfeited everything he owned and he was banished from Norway. Wow. Banished? So these people took their drinking seriously. <laughs> and apparently... Being able to attend a drinking party was one proof of competence. The same law states, so long as a man has his wits, knows how to manage his household and his business, and is able to ride a horse and to join in an ale feast, he shall have control of his property. Oh. <laughs> so if you imbibe this holiday season, you should know that you're partaking of a very ancient custom that has both spiritual and legal origins. <laughs> so imbibing was also considered a religious act, which is, as um, as Kim touched on earlier, in fact, celebrating Yule was sometimes referred to as drinking Yule. Drinking Yule was a phrase that was used and people drank to peace and plenty. And that was a toast to Frey, the god Frey, who was the god of peace and plenty. Um, the Christianized Gulatin law cites these required ale feasts were to be held before All Saints Day and another on Holy Night to give thanks to Christ and St. Mary for peace and a fruitful harvest instead of free. That's um, so, you're, you're drinking, to, you're supposed to drink a lot for St. Mary? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And of course, St. Mary could have been Frigg or Freya. Mm -hmm. She was to stand in for them. So they just just switched the dates and the and the and the gods that they were drinking to. 
Um, this really bears a strong resemblance to these ale feasts that were given in pagan times when the Yule toasts were made to Odin for victory in war, to Freyr for peace and plenty, and to the king. And lastly, the mini cup was drunk in remembrance of their ancestors and the dead. So there's a famous 10th century program, poem, sorry, Raffensmal, and it praised Harold Fairhair, who was the king at the time, for preferring to drink yol at sea than in a warm hall with his down mittens. With his down mittens. Down mittens, yes. <laughs> so here I'll, I'll just read you the quote. The courageous leader wants to toast the yuletide out at sea. If he alone has his way and practice the sport of frere, when young, he grew tired of cooking by the fire and sitting indoors and of a warm woman's chamber and of mittens filled with down. Ooh. <laughs> so he was a tough guy. And in pagan times, there were animals that were associated, of course. And one of them was the Yule boar, which was in, in honor of the god Freyr. And it was known as the oath boar. And people would lay their hands on the bristles of the boar as it was led around the room and uh, they would swear oaths of what they would accomplish in the new year kind of like our new year's resolutions in fact more than likely that's where it came from i had a lot of trouble imagining them leading an angry live boar around a drinking hall yeah but then i realized they probably drugged the animal to make him a little more passive so in my books where i where the yeah. yule, the oaf boar makes his appearance i have him drugged with herbs so that he's a little he's still pretty mad but he's not quite as active because that's you smart yeah, yeah i thought about that too because boars are <laughs> they are mean <laughs> And especially when they, when he's that mad. I mean, they've been, right. they captured him. They dragged him back to their hall. Anyway, uh, it's quite a picture, even drugged. I'm sure he was pretty ferocious. So there's a couple of poems that tell us about um, this sacred boar, which is called the Sonar Gultor. And I'm sorry, my pronunciation is probably off, but it was the sacred boar that would be after he was led around the, the hall he would be sacrificed kim you know one of these poems it's the one about helgi yeah uh, helgi and, and his brother heaven they don't really go into a lot of detail about how it actually works it's just a mention of this particular ritual so in this poem it's okay i'm going to try it helga vida hjorvard sonar <laughs> <laughs> it's Helgi, son of Hjorvarth. <laughs> so in this poem, Helgi's brother, Heaven, he was out traveling on Yule Eve when he encountered a troll woman. And we've mentioned troll women before. They're usually magical and often seen as dangerous. Usually if a woman is called a troll woman, there's something going on there. And whether she's a magical human woman or a Jotun woman or something else is never really made clear. Usually she's a troll, just a troll woman, but it's usually a witch or a Jotun or something like that. I think that. troll is kind of a generic term. Yeah. Because they also have a law and I, I believe it was an Icelandic law, the Grey Goose laws. They talk about it's, it, it's illegal to sit outside and wake up the trolls. Oh, so it's huh. Utiseta, which is they're sitting out, and so and there you usually call on the spirits. So there, you know, the trolls are anything. I think anything that yeah, it's uh, kind of like magical. a word like monster or something, mm -hmm. or yeah, just a yeah. generic word. Yep. So this particular troll woman, she was riding a wolf and using snakes as the reins, which <laughs> I love that visual. I think there's yeah. one other place where. Mm -hmm. somebody there is, is she's riding one. a wolf and using snakes as reins. I mean, what a it's cool the visual. One with, I, I think it's the one with uh, Hunla and uh, Freya, maybe. Anyway, oh, I think maybe. that's where the mention is. So she offered to accompany Heathen on his travels, and he said no. And she told him he'd pay for that at the feast when <laughs> they made their toasts. And Heathen did end up making an oath that he regretted making. It turned out okay, I think. But yeah. So he did make it to the feast. 
And like Johanna said, the boar was brought around and the men laid their hands on it when they swore their oaths and they drank. It was clear that they were making their oaths and drinking. So, <laughs> so yeah, like Johanna mentioned, oaths were a big deal in the Viking world. And, and men were held to their oaths, especially if they were made at Yule and especially if they placed their hand on the boar. I mean, you could be killed for not following yes. through with your- An oath. outlawed. An outlawed, there, yes. There were lots of stiff penalties for that. So yes, oaths were taken very seriously. Even though you were maybe drunk at the time, everyone remembered your yeah. oath. <laughs> and well, they yeah, would and that was... remind you the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, that was... <laughs> And, you know, one of the worst things you could be was an oath breaker. Yep. I mean, that yep. was really horrible. I mean, it it's, was. you know, if we're thinking of these oaths, like our New Year's resolution resolutions, you know, it's like magnified, like by a hundred. Yeah. Now we don't really expect us to actually hold to them, but right. I, I'm pretty sure that these uh, came down, th those resolutions came down to us from Viking times and earlier. I mean, yeah. Viking yeah. times is what we have a record of, but I'm sure that they didn't invent it. I'm sure it was around for centuries before this. Yeah, probably. I mean, imagine making your New Year's resolution like I'm going to, you know, start exercising three days a week. And then, you know, three months later, you're not doing it. And somebody remembers <laughs> and they can outlaw you or. Yeah. <laughs> take your property. <laughs> Cut your head off. <laughs> I'll take that pound of flesh. <laughs> I think hey, we'd be a little more careful about. We'd, <laughs> we'd be pretty careful about the oaths we made if we, yeah, <laughs> if we exactly. had those consequences. <laughs> well, uh, there were some other animals that were related to Yule, and one of them was the Yule book. And he was, these were, there were two goats, and they were the goats that pulled Thor's chariot uh, around the sky. And that's what the sound of that chariot is what made thunder, supposedly. And one goat was named Tangrisnir, which means teeth bearer, like as in bearing his teeth, not carrying them. And uh, boy, this one's a hard one. Thangyastir, <laughs> which is teeth grinder. Uh, so you can imagine that these goats are making the thunder, the sound of thunder. So Thor can butcher these goats and eat them and bring them back to life with his hammer, Mjolnir. And one night, Thor stays with a poor family and he cooks his goats for the family, but he warns them, do not injure the bones. While Thor is sleeping, the son of the house splits open one of the goat's bones to get at the marrow. And in the morning, when Thor resurrects his goats, one of them is lame. Uh -oh. Thor is furious, but the parents beg him to spare their lives. And so in repayment, Thor took the children as his servants. Now, nowadays we have a straw goat that's made from the last sheaf of grain in the fields. That's a, a uh, tradition that's still being carried on in Scandinavia. I actually have a, a Oh, a Yule book? A, a Yule book. Yeah, I have a oh, little, cool. I love a little straw goat that has a little red ribbon on his neck and he saw my Christmas tree at Christmas. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. And um, so also in Scandinavia, in some parts of Scandinavia, there has been a tradition called Yule booking. And it was, it's like trick or treating, only it's adults as well as children. So between Christmas and New Year's, people would dress in costumes and they'd go to door to door singing Christmas carols in exchange for treats and being invited in for refreshments. So I do not know if that is still a tradition in Scandinavia, but it was and uh, even in the early 1900s. Well, caroling so, was a, a bigger thing. Yes. A while. I mean, I even remember when I was a kid, we... A couple of times we went caroling around the neighborhood and occasionally people would bring us out something to drink or, you know, something like that. It was fun, but I don't see it happening anymore. So Yeah. And people in this country, I don't think have ever dressed in costumes, whereas in Scandinavia, no. they did dress in costumes at one time. So um, that's a very interesting way a tradition has evolved. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of stories about Yule Bucking and what it originally was but uh, they talk about young people going around and 
you know, literally trick or treating and causing mischief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it is possible that that is where it originated. But um, some of our traditions that originate from Viking times or earlier include the Yule log, which is big in England, but it's has been around since before Viking times. And the household would bring in a huge log. And remember, they had long fires at that time. So the fireplace, fire pit was this long thing that ran the length of the room. And they would put a log on there that was big enough to burn through the whole season. Well, remember, this season was more than a month long sometimes. You know, it, it really depended on the moon. But it was very bad luck if the log burnt out before the season was over. So they would carve runes in this log and they had ceremonies surrounding it. And to start the new, a piece of the old log was always saved and it was used in the next following year to start the new one, which symbolized the cycle of years and how, you know, the it never completely died. Another thing is the Christmas tree. The evergreen tree was brought into the house, apparently, and they, it was decorated with images of the gods and food and clothing, all kinds of decorations on it. Also, the original Yule wreath was uh, set on fire and rolled down a hill to symbolize the return of the sun. Oh, well, that must have been something to see yeah yeah no kidding especially if you're way up north where it was dark all the time mm. imagine having a big wreath and setting it on fire and of course it's evergreen so it's got sap and it's snapping and popping and it's rolling down this snowy hill i mean that mm. yeah cool. i can understand that i mean it even here it it gets dark earlier and uh you know i always have my christmas lights on because i just crave the light yeah. I don't have that issue. No. <laughs> <laughs> Down here in the southern part of the country, it's pretty light. I mean, we still, even in the darkest part of the winter, it's still light. It gets light at, say, 730, and it doesn't. Get, it gets dark at, say, 5, 530. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's not here. like up here in the northern. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the reasons a lot of people like living here, because it doesn't yep. get dark in the winter. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. Well, right. So <laughs> every year in December, memes and articles and listicles, everything you can think of, they start <laughs> circulating, talking about how Santa Claus was inspired by Odin. And it often even brings up a lot of debates. People are going, yes, it was. No. So I'm not necessarily going to take a side. <laughs> <laughs> just maybe like here's some of the ways he could have been inspired by Odin <laughs> and here's maybe not. So uh, there are actually a lot of details about Odin and other aspects of North mythology that may have seeped into the figure of Santa Claus. However, in all of the stories and sagas that I've read in which Odin figures, and I can't claim to have read everything, he is never a benevolent character like Santa Claus. Have you ever read about him no. being? No, <laughs> he's not a really he's not a guy you want to meet in a dark alley. No. So when Odin gives gifts and he does, I mean, there are parts of sagas where he gives gifts to kings or other people. There's usually strings attached or he has an agenda, even if that agenda is just that he wants that particular king or warrior to join his army for when Ragnarok comes. And Which, of course, means that he claims him early, too. Right. True. It's not always a good thing. <laughs> no. So and although he's revered by kings and jarls and other prominent men, Odin, yeah, like we said, he was feared more than he was loved. And honestly, I can see Thor being a better inspiration for like our jolly, red-faced, bearded Santa Claus. Yeah, he does have likes... that kind of Santa Claus uh, personality, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He's a little one... more violent, though. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like Thor was the guy. The... <laughs> <laughs> I guess Santa Claus had a big giant hammer in his hand that he'd be. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, interestingly enough, in Scandinavian countries until the 19th century, it was the Eula book which is Thor's goat. Thor's goat. Yeah, that's that true. brought gifts 
Sometimes it was a man dressed in a goat hide, even. Oh, so, you know, I mean, I maybe. don't know how that evolved. And Thor was definitely the god of the people. He he's was. The, he's he was the one they loved, and and Freyr to more, you know, more than Odin. Odin was not that guy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they knew better. <laughs> yeah. Before 1931, which is when Coca-Cola created that image of Santa that we all know, Mm -hmm. Santa had many different looks. I've seen pictures of him when he looks like a kind of like a gnome. He's kind of short and squat, like like a garden gnome kind of thing. Or he's like Father Christmas, where he wears a you know a green cloak or a brown cloak instead of the red one. Oh. And it's usually longer, like, and these are often Scandinavian or like more Germanic kind of images, or even maybe the from the UK, you know, where he's like the, the cloak is a little longer. He often has a staff in some of these pictures and he has a long white beard, which is similar to Odin, but it would not have been unusual for an old man to have a bushy white beard. I don't think that would have been an uncommon thing. Well, and didn't he, didn't Santa Claus or Father Christmas always have both of his eyes? Yes. Well, I was going to say that. <laughs> That's a dead giveaway for Odin. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also uh, the new Santa is, you know, in his red, that Coca-Cola red, that Odin never wore red. He either no. wore blue or brown or gray or something. So that's a little, that's in those older images when he's wearing either a blue cloak or a brown cloak, that's a little bit more, a little closer to what Odin would have been wearing. So yeah. And he, and Odin sacrificed that one eye. So he, no matter what, when he's disguised, he always just has one eye or there's something over the eye or something is going on with that eye. And I don't think that sacrificing a body part to gain wisdom would go down really well with our Santa Claus lore. So no. <laughs> I'm sure that's why Santa still Don't has this at home, boys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to have some wisdom, go down to the well of Mimir and sacrifice your eye. Now pluck it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I... you know, one of Odin's names is Wanderer. So that's it's true. Yeah. yeah. yeah and through all the worlds. Yeah, and Odin has his ravens, Hugin and Munin, who mm-hmm. travel through all the worlds and report back to him. Just, you know, maybe kind of like Santa knows whether you've been good or bad. Yeah. Except he doesn't have ravens who are bringing that information back to him. No, we don't really know. on the other hand. Well, we don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there could be a connection between Santa and his sleigh and the wild hunt. That we talked about earlier, except the wild hunt is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. You know, no one ever sees Santa or they're not supposed to. We just hear the hoof beats and the sleigh on the rooftops. So there's a little bit of an echo there, I think. Absolutely. Some of those things certainly could have been woven into a more palatable story for children. Because you're not going to tell <laughs> children about some of these things things that Odin did but um, oh gosh no (laughs) and and the whole reindeer thing you know that's definitely a Nordic yeah I mean it didn't come from England no that's for sure it might be more of a Laplander kind Mm -hmm. of thing I don't know that influence yeah Odin did have his horse Sleipnir who had eight legs I mean I think it's a little bit of a stretch to go from eight legs to eight reindeer but eight tiny reindeer (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) but um Sleipnir did have a sleigh or a yep. sled that he would pull. And on the in the poem Sigdrifimal in the Poetic Edda, it said that car, runes were carved on the reins of Sleipnir and on the reins of his sled. Uh-huh. So he did pull a sled and his horse was Odin's. So I don't know. Very interesting. Yes. And then, so Odin had... How many names? Like 80 names or something. Oh, many, like many, that. many, many. One of them was Yule Father or Yule Father. And he is also known as Oski, which means the god of wishes. Mm. But I'm not sure I would pray to Odin and ask him for. <laughs> no way. <laughs> not, I don't know what would. too high. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a little more like a deal with the devil than it is a deal with Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's what your book, the a deal with, Odin, a deal with Odin. reminded Odin. me of. <laughs> Yeah, she had to use all her wits to get out of that one. Boy, she did. And then, of course, there are the elves. Well, I guess the North Pole. Santa lives up in the North Pole, which is up in, you know, the yeah. Arctic Circle, which is part of Scandinavia. And Santa had his elves who make toys in his workshop. And while Odin didn't have elves like Santa Claus, the dwarves in Norse, myth- Norse mythology made many items for the gods. They had Odin's spear Gungnir was made by them, Freya's necklace Brisingamen, Thor's hammer and his belt, and his gloves. Too, oh, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And Frey had a golden boar named Gulenbursti, and Frey also had a magical ship. I love Frey's magical ship. Yes. If our listeners don't know about it, it, it was magical that it could, it could travel on land and on water, and it could be big enough to hold all the gods and everybody, and then shrink down small enough that you could like tuck it away in your pouch. I just think that's such a cool. I agree. <laughs> cool <ship>. I want one. <laughs> I know. Or even a car like that. Oh, okay. I'm at my destination. I'll just par- put my car in my pouch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the whole issue of elves is a bit confusing. I did a lot of research about them for my books and, um, you know, the prose edda mentions the Svart Alfar, which are the dark elves and the, or the black elves, and the Duk Alfar, which are dark elves, and they live underground. It's under unclear whether they are the same as the Dvergar or dwarfs, or if they were a separate kind of being, although they really seem to have similar skills. They all live underground. They're all smiths. They make things. So they could be synonymous, different, just different words for the same creatures, or they might be separate creatures. Then there's the Lyos Alfar, the light elves. And if you remember the Lord of the Rings, the light elves are, you know, very, uh, they're very prominent. Galadriel, you know, all the, most of the elves in that story are all light elves. Mm -hmm. Didn't they say in the, in the stories that they it was like the sun was shining out of them. They were so yes. beautiful. And they and they they also call them the glory of the sun. Mm-hmm. So there were the light elves were tall and beautiful, and they sound a bit like angels, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're mentioned in pr- the prose edda as living in Elfheim, which is high up in the branches of Yggdrasil, and it's not far from Asgard. So they're like second to the gods. And Freyr was the Lord of the Elves. And the smith Voland was also called the Prince of Elves. But were they talking about dark elves or light elves? With Frey, you can be pretty sure that it was the light elves. But with Voland, he was a smith. So was were they talking about the dark elves? We just hmm. don't know that at all. Mm-hmm. And then, <laughs> when a person died, they could become an elf in the mound like Olaf Gierstad Elf. And so those were the ancestors, uh, the counterpart of the Desir. The, so the Elfar were the male and the Desir were the female spirits of ancestors. Uh, we just don't know. Mm-hmm. So somehow people could become deified and become a, an elf in their mound. So it, it can be very confusing. There's multiple meanings for the same words. So uh, the Alfar do not seem to be associated with Yol in Viking times, particularly. They had their own feast, which it seems to be in the fall, accord, or according to the Old Norse calendar, the beginning of winter. And that is more of a lunar event than it is a, a monthly, you know, it's not like October or November. It's more like the first the first full moon after the solstice or the equinox. Uh, the Alpha Blot is mentioned in Snorri Sturluson's Heims Kringla in the saga of St. Olaf, although we're not really given any description of it, but a poet comes to a, a house in Sweden and asks for lodging, and the woman won't let him in because they're having a sacrifice to the elves. 
And he goes to another place and another place and he's turned away. So this was in the fall, the beginning of winter. And so that's our information that tells us that this was when they held the sacrifice. But if uh, it's still, if it's, you know, say earlier in the year for us, say October, November-ish, that's still kind of close with this sacrifice to the elves and Christmas time. Well, and, and they also had winter nights, which is, uh, you know, the, the autumn holiday. And um, that was another ale feast. And my mm-hmm. thought is probably that the the alpha blot occurred mm-hmm. then. But there's also then the Disa blot. Right. And That's around is, February or so. Isn't well, it? there's one well, mention of it. Yes. But the question is, did they celebrate these festivals at different times? Did they have more than one sacrifice a year? It would seem like maybe they did. Uh, so it, it's a and it could be something that moved around. You know, a holiday that moved around. We just don't know. But I, I think that the the thought that the alpha blot was in the fall, probably after the harvest, thanks mm-hmm. for the harvest, and especially when it's associated with Frere, you know, it, mm-hmm. it makes sense. Yeah, that makes me. sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're still kind of confused over that one. And then to add to that, there were the vetter, the spirits. Um, so or whites, whites, the uh, land whites. The spirits of the land, the waterfalls, the rocks, um, these creatures could be helpful or hindering to the farm and the livestock and the people who live on the farm. They sound a bit more like the elves that we're accustomed to, like the shoemaker's elves. Mm. And they actually can sometimes take care of the livestock. But don't underestimate them. Because in an earlier episode, we talked about how Eagle Skallagrimson cursed King Eric Bloodaxe and Queen Gunild and turned the Vetter against them, which drove them out of Norway. So without the support of the Vetter, you are in trouble. There are also uh, Vetter that protect Iceland from enemies. There's a whole saga about that, which I won't go into now. But in modern times, Scandinavia has the Nisa and the Tomta. These are little folks who help around the house and the farm, and some of them wear red caps, and they look like garden gnomes. So, you know, are these the Vetter? It sounds uh-huh. kind of like maybe they're the Vetter to me. And, of course, there's the Hulda folk, hidden folk in Iceland, which is a whole other topic. Yeah. Um, so I wonder so if the little the Nisa and the Tomte reminds me of, like, brownies. Right. In, in English folklore that maybe you leave out some food and some milk for the brownie and that'll do things around your house. Well, and they had little, um, depre- there were things called elf cups that were depressions in stone that had been carved in rocks. And you were supposed to pour ale or milk in these for the vetter or the elves or whoever, but they were called elf cups. Well, that sounds like well, we leave stuff out for Santa Claus. So we mm-hmm. leave milk, milk and cookies. Milk and cookies out for Santa Claus. <laughs> yes. Yes. Ah, that brings that all back right to. <laughs> it sure does. It was Santa inspired by Norse mythology. But yeah. there's also a tradition of leaving out food for the dead ancestors. Yeah. Food and drink for the dead ancestors over the Yule holidays. And I've even read of. Um, people abandoning their beds so that the dead ancestors could have one night in a soft bed. So there's an awful lot of stories there, but that kind of lends itself to the milk and cookies also. Yeah. (laughs) So interesting. It is very interesting. Yes. And so much we don't know. So we've just kind of, wow, that was actually a lot more about Norse mythology and Santa Claus than I realized when we first when I first started, I know <laughs> I kept just digging and going, oh, well, what about this? What about this? Because <laughs> we just we have this the image. Answers. Yeah, we just have this image in our mind that Coca-Cola, that adver- it was an advertising image of Santa Claus. And that's what we are stuck with. But that was not even 100 years ago. And it goes back so much further. Exactly. I guess we can leave it up to our listeners to decide if mm-hmm. they think Santa Claus is inspired by by Odin. Well, and you're you're celebrating grand traditions regardless of where they came from. Right. That's true. Well, that was fun. It was. <laughs>
Well, I hope you have a great holiday season. Yes, you too. I guess we'll probably have a ham instead of a boar. (laughs) (laughs) As long as it makes Frere happy. Yes. Be careful what oaths you make. I don't do that actually (laughs) i don't either (laughs) yeah that's funny i just was like yeah so what do we got next episode i think this one's going to be a special one isn't it yes we're going to have a guest yay (laughs) that'll be fun yes patricia bracewell the author of the emma of normandy trilogy and actually she's writing a fourth book now so there are three books out and one to come uh so i'm very excited to talk to her about emma who was an English queen, but she was of Norse, Danish, and Norman descent. And she had such an interesting life. And I I love Patricia's books. So it'll be really, really great to talk to her. Yes, it will. All right. I guess we'll see you next time. Yep. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can find Johanna at johannawittenberg.com, where you'll find a free short story, a prequel to her Norse Queen series. And you can find me, KS, at ksbarton.com, where you can also find a free short story from me, a prequel to my Norse family series. See you next time.